not long. Yeah, it's on. Oh. Oh. Uh, make sure. Hold on. There we go. Yeah, so when you're done. Good deal. It's on now. So it's hot. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time to join us. I want to thank our local media for uh, being present as well. Uh, my name is um, Adrian Garcia, County Commissioner of Precinct 2, and um, I want to welcome you to today's uh, press conference. For our Spanish media, vamos a tener la oportunidad de tener entrevistas ya después de la conferencia de prensa. Así que vamos a tener este, varias personas aquí uh, capacitadas para darles entrevistas directamente. Gracias. Thank you. And so with that, let me acknowledge uh, the distinguished guests that are with me today. Uh, to my left, I have uh, uh, Chief Edison Toquica of the Harris County Sheriff's Office, Executive Assistant Chief Larry Satterwhite with the Houston Police Department, uh, Lori uh, Leader, uh, with Moms uh, Demand uh, Action, and we have, um, and then we have uh, uh, a gun violence survivor that is uh, with us, Angelica Halfen. Angelica, thank you, and Emily Whitehurst with the Houston Area Women's Center as well. So thank you all for being here. Every one of these individuals brings a very important dynamic to this conversation about what is happening in Texas. Today, Texas is putting into effect a law that makes no sense. It's a law that actually will make Texas less safe. And so with that, this new Texas permitless carry law goes into effect, and we will show clearly that it threatens public safety. Untrained and potentially dangerous individuals who have no business will be able to openly carry weapons in our community. Our law enforcement colleagues on the panel will speak to the challenges and concerns uh, from that, uh, with that law. Actions taken by the state over the last decade have been done in the name of public safety, but it's clear that these actions have made us less safe. In the less than 10 years, we've seen the advent of open carry, campus carry, reduced training hours, and now the good old Wild West is back with us once again with the permitless carry of weapons. In that time, in the decade or so, firearm crimes have actually risen by 10%, not declined. The state has also handcuffed our local law enforcement officers and made it more difficult for them to identify threats. This new law is yet another action that further threatens public safety at a time when we are seeing an increase in violent crime. And specifically, the data is clear. If you look to these two charts here, you will see how it identifies, number one, the increases of crime, secondly, and how it is related to firearms, and then secondly, the fact that the state legislature handcuffs local communities, local authorities, from being able to implement common sense laws and regulations that would keep us safe. That is the chart uh, to the further right, to, the, to your further right. Every time the Texas legislature has eliminated common sense laws in the past, we've seen a spike in violent crime. And as a longtime law enforcement officer, number one, I applaud and respect and admire those who continue to wear the badge and carry a gun 
in the name of public safety and run to the things that would likely harm the rest of us. And so we applaud them. We appreciate them. We respect them. But today, their jobs just got harder. And so safety is always going to be on the top of my priority list. The state has consistently made bad decisions and made our communities less safe. Today is evident of that. One of the worst things that they did was take away the ability for cities and counties to take basic common sense steps to protect our communities. It's bad enough that they're passing laws at the state level that threaten public safety. They have taken dramatic steps to prevent anyone else from taking steps to address gun violence. The Texas legislature has dramatically limited county government's ability to reduce gun violence before, before it happens. In Harris County, we would like to do more to keep people safe. Check out this non-exhaustive non list of all that we can't do. And again, that uh, chart to your further right is, uh, is an example of the things that we cannot do. Thank you to Governor Abbott and thank you uh, to the Republican-led legislature. We can't force safe storage of weapons in vehicles. We can't ban weapons in public places, including parks, community centers, libraries, government facilities, such as the tax assessor's office. We can't force background checks. Oh my God. And that is supposed to make sense. We can't require licensing. We can't disallow weapons at performance spaces such as the Wortham Center, Miller Outdoor Theater, and Discovery Green Park. Now, this list that I just rattled off only accounts for about a third, less than a third, of the preemptions of county actions. To make up the failures of the state, we have increased law enforcement budgets. We have increased it by a hundred million in the last two and a half years, in fact. And we have implemented smart solutions wherever we can to make a difference, such as the shot spotter uh, program that we have implemented in East Aldine community that uh, is force multiplying local law enforcement to be able to arrest and respond to gunshots in neighborhoods. So it's our property taxes that pay ultimately for the state's failures. It's ludicrous that the state has tied our hands when it comes to keeping citizens safe. As this law goes into effect today, I want to encourage residents in Harris County to take common sense steps on their own because, folks, we are on our own. Nori from Moms Demand Action will have more about what citizens across our county can do. It's clear that we have, uh, that it's clear we're on our own, as I mentioned earlier. State leaders beholden to fears of primary challenges are more concerned with their political future than you being able to keep your kids' ball game, uh, being able to go to your kids' ball game uh, without fear of being shot. So I urge you to be a safety example. Practice safe storage of your firearms. We know that accidents can happen at home. We also know that stolen firearms pose one of the greatest threats on the streets to the average citizen as well as to our law enforcement officers. Lock up your guns and keep them safe. If you purchase a weapon, it's worth it to be trained. You can still take a class 
for concealed carry. We all have a duty to be responsible, to be a responsible gun owner. And finally, call your Texas legislators. They're still in session. Tell them to get to work on real solutions that will make our community safer instead, or get out of the way and let local governments do the job and lead. So with that, uh, let me uh, once again thank our panelists here, and I'll uh, like to introduce to you and have him make some uh, brief remarks, is uh, Chief Tokika of the Harris County Sheriff's Office. Chief, thank you for being here. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, and thank you for being with us here this morning. Um, let me take a, a minute to address those of you that are contemplating uh, adding a gun to the list of things that you walk out the door with every morning, you know, with your cup of coffee and your keys and your cell phone. Uh, it's going to change the way that you live life because, uh, see, the law applies the same to you as a citizen as it does to me as a trained police officer. We have countless hours of training uh, on how to enforce the law, on how to operate and use our weapons when we, when we need to. God forbid we ever have to use it in, in an act of deadly force. We know when to use it. But even then, uh, we have to always make split-second decisions that are scrutinized uh, by all. So now, <clears throat> if you choose to do that, you too will uh, be scrutinized. Your life will change. Um, quite often, we investigate um, cases where, where citizens tell us that they used their weapon in self-defense and killed somebody only for us to determine um, upon the completion of the investigation that it was an unjustified shooting. And they all have consequences that will last um, and will last a lifetime. So uh, I urge you, please, before you decide to arm yourself in public, make sure that you uh, make the right decisions, make sure that you understand the law, and make sure that you get trained to be able to use that weapon. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Takika, and thank you to uh, Sheriff Gonzalez uh, for his leadership. He has been a long-time advocate for common sense gun safety. Uh, now we have Executive uh, Assistant Chief uh, Larry Satterwhite. Thank you, Commissioner. So we know that most gun owners are, are people lawfully in possession of those firearms. But what we're asking for is responsibility in the possession and carrying of a firearm. Overwhelmingly, the number of people that engage in shootings and crimes in our city, in the city of Houston, are people who would never be able to carry a firearm. The question is, how did they get that gun? And this is the problem. Last year alone, we had almost 3,000 guns stolen from cars. Not just from homes, that's just from cars. Uh, where gun owners had their gun in a, in a vehicle and it was targeted by a criminal who stole that gun. And then a lot of those guns are used in our shootings, our homicides, and our violent crimes. This year alone, we're already over 2,000. Last year, the city experienced over 400 homicides and all, over 350 of them were with a the firearm. This year, we're over 300 already and most of them with a firearm. We are asking for gun responsibility. If you're going to carry, we're asking you to make sure that that weapon does not fall into the hands of a criminal. Chief, thank you. And also give our appreciation to uh, Chief Troy Finner for his leadership of the Houston Police Department. Uh, now I'd like to ask uh, Nori Leader with uh, uh, Moms Demand Action. Thank you, Lori, for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, we want to make sure that uh, the community knows that there are things that they can do to prohibit permitless carry. We are not powerless in, in the face of this. Um, and one thing, we, we did this during open carry and we're doing it now during permitless carry. The way to prohibit this, if you are a private business owner, if you are in a house of worship, if you are a uh, non, run a nonprofit, a daycare center, the way to prohibit permitless carry is through signage. And um, this is the sign that will be required for people to post if they want to prohibit permitless carry. Um, we have a website where, uh, that we can share with you as well as a QR code. 
um, for, po for folks that want a uh, PDF link to this so that it can be printed off easily. Um, I also would point out that people, businesses, the same group that I listed, can prohibit licensed concealed carry and licensed open carry if they would like to do so. So those avenues are available um, to do, and um, we encourage businesses to consider all of these um, because, let's face it, who wants to uh, have dinner with their family sitting next to somebody that's had no training and not undergone a background check? Um, the, uh, I just want to hold up very quickly. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the sign that's required to prohibit uh, licensed concealed carry, and there's another sign just like it to, to prohibit uh, licensed open carry. And as you can see, it is an enormous sign, and um, this is part of the Texas state legislators, uh, legislature's lead under um, under uh, the gun lobby's um, support, thank you so much, <laughs> um, to make it difficult for private businesses to prohibit carry on their, on their property. And uh, we are the only state in the United States that has this kind of signage scheme with this amount of legalese. Uh, the font size is mandated. It must be in both English and Spanish. And it's a real hindrance to businesses that um, in any other state would be able to post a graphic that says no guns, that's you know of a reasonable size that um, a, a gun owner would see it. And so um, this is another thing that, that you know, businesses and regular Texans are facing to ensure public safety on their private premises. And I just really, really want to commend the commissioner and local law enforcement and, and everyone on the local front that is working creatively to, uh, to promote public safety while we're basically trying to climb up a waterfall of uh, laws that, that, that um, embolden irresponsible gun ownership. So thank you so much. Nori, thank you again, and thank you to the members of Moms Demand Action. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your voice. Uh, you are the mothers of our children, and the safety and well-being of your children we know is first and foremost. And with that, let me uh, just uh, recognize uh, that this conversation is important because there are victims. Uh, Chief Satterwhite just touched on the significance and the deadly intersection that firearms and local homicides have had. And uh, here with us today is a gun violence uh, surviving family member, Angelica Halfen. She'll then ask uh, Emily Whitehurst uh, to share re some remarks that will further make the point of the deadly consequence uh, that occurs with domestic violence and the combination of firearms in homes. Thank you. Hello, I'm here to share my story. Well, actually, my son's story, Harrison Schmidt. He was only 18. He had his whole life ahead of him, and he was just not a regular kid. He was a special kid. He helped me with my parents, as my father suffering from Alzheimer. He was the one kid that people would call because they knew he was home. He never went out. He liked being home, kind of a homebody. But our lives changed Halloween night, 2019. As my son finished work, he was driving a friend home. They got into an altercation with another young man, 22 years old, who had lost his temper earlier with a bunch of trick-or-treaters. And when it got time he got to my son, he lost his temper, pulled up and shot my son in the head. My son fought for 18 days, very painfully, through a lot of operations trying to save his life. The day that I went to get my son to Memorial Hermann, he ended up dying of sepsis. I wanted to tell the story more than anything is because our children are special and we hear the statistics. This is a statistic, this is a person. When he died, I died. And I fight every day. I resigned from HISD after 29 years. I fight to get up in the morning my parents, his sister, they were close. That's why when I was putting this together, I wanted people to know that it wasn't just him. It was his sister. It was me. It was his dad. It was everybody, his grandparents. We all suffer from this kid. When he was in the hospital, all these parents came up and children, you know what? Whenever my daughter had to go somewhere, I would say, can you Harrison come with you? 
Harrison would get calls sometimes. Ma, I got called. Somebody couldn't get a ride home from work. It was like 1130, but I knew what kind of kid he was. I knew he would never went out. He would always go and they'd go, mom's going to be a little, couple more minutes. But he was that kind of kid. He always texted me. So when I didn't get that answer, but because how the crime was back in 2019, not only did I not get contacted, my son was put under um, an unknown, even though his car was registered. He had all the insurance. I, he argued with me, mom, don't waste money on full insurance for me. I said, no, if anything happens to you, baby, I want you to have the best. He got the worst. They presumed that he was just a gang member. Um, my sweet baby boy, he was big, he was tall. But that's what they presumed. And so, but most I want to point out is this sweet boy who was my heart and my soul. He was shot by a young boy who was not a criminal, lived with his mom and his sister. And he bought the gun legally, but he had no training and he wasn't mature enough. So that's my concern. And as a person that was an education for most of my life, we're kind of failing our kids right now in education as we focus on the star. So our kids are not learning about they're not even allowed to play in pre-K and K because they have to focus on letters and sounds now. Puzzles. Oh, no, that's a waste of time. And you're talking to a person who was in HISD and saw it firsthand. These kids are going to grow up. Do you know they're, how they're going to treat each other? No. I've had to break up fights where kids are practically beating each other up over it was my turn to pass the cards because they don't know how to work things out. So let's put that human aspect. I fight every day. I don't want to live, but I have to. I have to fight for him. I have to fight for my daughter, my parents, and my friends. And his friends. He has a friend of his that went back into the hospital because she can't get over his death. So let's think about that. Let's think about his rights for a life. And for our rights to be happy and, and be safe. My daughter lives in New York. I think she's safer right now because of what we're doing here in Houston. And that breaks my heart because I was born here, raised here. I'm Houston. But please, as you're talking to your councilman, as you're talking to people, let them know this isn't about, well, I just want to buy this, I want to get this. No, this, this is a weapon. My husband's in the Navy, and he I tell you, he came from Afghanistan. The training that he did was horrendous. It was incredible. But still, it does not prepare you. So we're going to give a gun to somebody, not knowing how they're feeling. We don't even know their medical background. Are they angry, how they're feeling? But I tell you, Harrison Schmidt was just an incredible angel on earth. And... If I can keep this message going, we are going in the wrong direction. We're going in the wrong direction with guns and in an education. And it needs to stop. And we need to not blame anybody. We just need to make the change together. Thank you. Let's take a breath. I really appreciate your courage and your fight. We need people like you. And I am just so grateful for your struggle because uh, it is going to take all of us together. And it's not about blame today, uh, but it is about grit. So I'm here as the CEO of the Houston Area Women's Center, and I'm speaking on behalf of survivors, um, particularly survivors who have the least access to supportive services. Um, and who are most likely to be negatively impacted by this law. We run a 24-hour hotline, and we last year managed 46,000 calls. And what we know is that violence is spiking, women and children are dying, and they're dying from guns. And more guns in our community is going to mean more women and children who are dying. And that impact is not going to be equally felt. 
it's going to be felt in low-income communities of color where women are more vulnerable to this type of violence because the services that they need are not there and the resources that they need are not there. And they are going to call our hotline and they're going to want out. And you know what? We're not going to have enough shelter beds for them. And so there they're going to be facing violence, homelessness, economic disenfranchisement, and a barrel of a gun that nobody has any practical way to get out of the hands of their abuser. In this state, we are the most murderous state by guns for women and children. It is chilling. And what I want to know is why, when we are so clear this will be the consequence, we have frontline advocates every day answering calls. We know what's going to happen. So why? Why are we doing this? You tell me that. That's what I want to know today. Emily, thank you, and thank you to the Houston Area Women's Center for always being there uh, for victims of, of domestic violence. Thank you for all the services that you provide. Um, again, thank you to this distinguished group of panelists. Uh, questions, if there's any questions from the media for anyone, any one of the folks here. Right. Absolutely, we are concerned. Um, and now we're faced with uh, placing guns in the hands of people that are untrained to use a weapon. So Houston Harris County has experienced a, a spike in violent crime, road rage um, incidents. This is going to just probably add to that problem. Um, it, when you put a gun in the hand of somebody that's not trained, like you've heard here today, sadly enough, apparently he was a good kid. But he made a bad decision that has consequences for, for the rest of his life. And so, absolutely, we are concerned. Um, we don't want to add to the problem, but, but we feel that this will add to the problem. Yes, just to echo Chief Takika. Um, you know, what we are seeing is an increase. Uh, you mentioned road rage, and, and it's a problem in our city. It's a problem in our country. And, uh, and that's a whole other dynamic that we've been facing and growing in, the, in, in our city. And uh, we've been battling and we've, we've all collaborated, you know, with Harris County and all the constables and the state and, and Metro and everybody. And, and we've made some good headway. But, yes, when, when people become enraged and they have access to a firearm at their fingertips, some people do not make the right decisions. So this is a constant challenge of when you have people who haven't thought this through, when they've had no training whatsoever and they find themselves in what they perceive as a volatile situation, of course we want people to be able to protect themselves. Of course we want people to be safe. And there are bad people out there. But you need the training. You need the experience. You need to understand what you're doing so that the right decision is made, is made instead of the wrong decision. And let me just say that uh, Precinct 2 uh, has also been a victim of uh, road rage. One of my stellar employees is still fighting for his life, uh, still going through surgeries, uh, fighting uh, pen, uh, the uh, COVID uh, in the hospital, um, all because of a senseless act uh, that someone uh, uh, decided to take against him. And so uh, the stories here all have um, you know, uh, uh, all have an impact. They're, they're, every comment that you, you've heard today speaks for many others that are out in the community. And so let me just try to 
you know, make it as, as simple to understand as possible. Assume everyone here is a law-abiding citizen, but also let's assume that some may not be. We won't know because the masses potentially could be carrying firearms. So the question to folks in law enforcement, how do you distinguish who is and who isn't eligible to carry a gun without a background check? Imagine how ridiculous that is uh, today for law enforcement to comprehend. Uh, imagine being called to a business uh, that maybe didn't put up the signage and but is concerned about someone, and yet you find others in the uh, in the restaurant or in the business. How do you distinguish? Where do you start? And then if something does happen, whether it is one of these many road rages, you, you can go to parks where alcohol is going to be consumed, public venues where alcohol is going to be consumed. Uh, you step on the wrong, literally, you step on the wrong toes. You bump into the wrong person. Um, and let me just say that historically on the street, there's been a term, that a, and the term is a bullet has no name. And I think we've heard that story today. And so when you have people who are untrained, um, who may have the wrong intentions, Aside from their intended target, there could be many other unintentional victims as a result of, number one, their lack of training, and number two, uh, maybe they should have never had a gun to begin with. Yes, ma'am. So it's, it's kind of all of those things. So, uh, yes, gun crimes are up, and, um, and those are, that's just the data. You can't run from the data. We, we know. Um, so, yes, gun crimes in terms of homicides, gun crimes in terms of shootings, and then, of course, robbery, aggravated robbery, other violent crimes, all of these things are, are up. And, um, and so this is, this is the challenge that we face is that uh, what's causing it? I, that, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, there are a few things that are hurting us right now, obviously with the number of, of persons out on bond that continue to commit their crimes, and we haven't been able to get them before a judge in a trial to, to, to deal with that and also serve the victims. So that's a whole other challenge that we're facing. But it's all built into the problems that we are facing right now. Thank you, Chief. I'm going to... Ask uh, the media if there's any more questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, actually, we're we're a little handicapped as as far as that's concerned. By law, we unless we have probable cause, we can't just walk up to you and ask if you have the right to carry because with this you know, new bill, new law, you do have the right to carry. So, so we are handicapped in, in some way. The only way that we can do that is uh, upon a Terry Frisk. If we feel that that, that person has uh, committed a crime or is about to commit a crime, we can do it then at that point. But until then, we cannot. A absolutely. It, it, it does. I mean, um, look, we, we have a lot of training. We do train our guys to, to uh, whenever they make a call for service, that, uh, that there is a gun present. Uh, if anything, we have to, you know, common sense tells you we bring a gun to every call we go to. So, yes, they are trained uh, to, to look for those things, but, but it is a concern. Yes. Uh, real quick, just to add to that, even before uh, this law, I mean, we have been on protests in the city, First Amendment demonstrations, where I've had two groups that 
are adamantly opposed to each other, uh, both groups uh, armed, and the police are stuck right in the middle. And I've had to have my officers, and we have stood right in the middle of those two groups to keep them apart. And so there's a lot of hoping and praying along the way that people do not make, you know, let their emotions get the best of them and, and, um, and do something horrible. So this is the challenge that law enforcement faces. We train our officers to deal with this. But like Chief Tokika said, I mean, it's, you know, we actually introduce a firearm to almost every situation because, because we're carrying, and now we know we just have to almost assume everybody's going to have a firearm, and we have to respond as safely while still respecting everybody's rights and being there for their, to help them, but still be cautious. It's, it's a fine line we walk. Let, let me just add to that. A dynamic. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I think I'm a little older than these two guys, uh, but I uh, am from the era where you used to be able to count on a patrol partner, someone in your patrol car that was with you uh, your entire shift. Uh, we transitioned away to single officer units. Um, part of the dispatching process is to, whenever the dispatcher believes that there is a greater likelihood that there is going to be danger opposed to the officers to send uh, another unit along with the primary unit uh, for support, for backup. Um, we don't have enough officers to cover all neighborhoods today. Uh, now the threat of concern for our law enforcement will be extraordinarily high as a result. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we'll now move to one-on-ones if there's any questions for any of the panelists by individual media. Thank you.